Amen. Amen. It's so good to see you. It's so good to worship the Lord with you. Being back here at Calvary uh, is just so wonderful. Uh, Yes, today we continue in our sermon series from the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian believers. And if you have your Bible or Bible app, you will find our passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, use one of our Bibles located underneath the seats in front of you, and you can turn to page 1,165, and you'll find that passage beginning there at the bottom of the page. Now, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we want to encourage you, please take a Bible home with you. We say it every week because we mean it. I was just having a conversation with, with, uh, uh, with Kathy, our, our church administrator, and she said, hey, we're running out of Bibles. Yay! That's what we want to do. We want to run out of Bibles and keep replenishing Bibles. So if you don't have a Bible, take one home, use it. Please read it and apply it to your life because we firmly believe if we read God's word and apply his word to our life, our lives will change for the glory of God. So I wanna welcome, we have a, a, a micro campus that's joining us today from Kalispell, Montana. And we're excited that you guys are joining us. We know that Pastor Chad is right there right now, so uh, you can have a time of fellowship and get up and shake hands and I'm just kidding. No, I mean, seriously, we're glad that you're there and we, we're excited about what God is doing there. Before I begin the sermon, um, I want to say thank you. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Calvary voted to affirm uh, God's call on my life here to serve as co-lead pastor. And uh, just, it's one of those things I, I knew and I sensed what God was doing and Pastor Chad knew and sensed and, and the deacons and executive committee and everybody knew and sensed what God was doing. But until the church affirms it, my stomach was upset for several weeks, right? And so I'm just so grateful. Uh, Calvary is such a wonderful place to be a part of. And if you're a first time guest, let me just tell you something. This is an incredible church family. Uh, I served in student ministry for about 17 years and uh, all the joy, all the excitement, all the hope, all the, all the love, all, everything that I experienced and helped nurture in student ministry, I see that happening here church-wide. It's like a big giant student ministry for people of all ages. And it's really, really exciting to be a part of that. So thanks for trusting me with that vote. Thanks for affirming me. Thanks for loving me. And uh, as you pray for me and for the rest of the leadership of Calvary, one of the things that you can pray is this. Ask God to help me stay out of his way and just let him work. Right? Just ask God to help me stay out of his way because I have a... I, I can get in God's way and I can mess things up sometimes. So pray that I wouldn't, or as Pastor Chad asked you to pray for him, just pray that we don't do anything dumb, right? And stay out of his way. In today's passage of scripture, Paul, as he's writing, he, he begins off with some very strong and harsh words. And he turns his attention toward people who were sharing the good news about Jesus, but insisted that if a person wanted to surrender their life to Jesus, that it required more than simply placing their faith in Jesus, that surrendering their lives to Jesus was not enough. Receiving forgiveness for their sins was not enough. And so as Paul addresses them, he starts off with some very harsh words. As you follow along in your Bible, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So uh, let's follow along and let's read together Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, Whatever happens, remember he's thinking he's under arrest, he could lose his life. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. 
I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless because of what, uh, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Now you can see those really harsh words that Paul begins this passage with. He called these people who were telling others about Jesus, uh, he, he told them that they were dogs and mutilators of the flesh because they were leading people to Jesus. Then they were instructing them to get circumcised. Now in the Old Testament, just to get everybody uncomfortable, we'll talk about circumcision for a minute, only because Paul mentions it. In the Old Testament, Circumcision was proof that a man was an Israelite. It was proof that they were God's chosen people. Now, why God chose circumcision to be the identifying mark for Israelites, I have no idea. But I can imagine what went through the Israelites' minds when they first heard that. You want me to cut what? I can't imagine what that was like. The first thing that, that Paul points out in this passage is he reminds the Philippian believers that life change, what I mean by life change is being born again, experiencing the power of Jesus Christ to forgive you of sins, doesn't happen by being good. Life change doesn't happen by being good. If you want to experience transformation, Church isn't about behavior. It's not about uh, correcting behavior. Church is about allowing you to experience the gospel of Jesus on the inside, being changed, being transformed on the inside. But what these individuals were doing, the reason why Paul called them dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh, is they were telling people about Jesus and then telling them that they needed to get circumcised, they needed to begin obeying the Old Testament law, and they needed to begin doing what they thought was the right thing to do, and they were wrong. See, they were, they were essentially saying, if you're really a committed follower of Jesus, you'll do this. If you really love Jesus, if you've really been born again, if you've really been forgiven for your sins... The next step is to pick up that knife and get busy. You know, since the earliest days of Christianity, people have been trying to corrupt this free gift of salvation that comes through trusting in Jesus Christ as the forgiver of our sins. And they teach that faith in God's grace is simply not enough. You can hear it. Often, sometimes in a podcast or on a radio show, you'll hear people teaching that faith in Christ is not enough. And maybe you grew up in a church that taught forgiveness of sins needed to be earned. That maybe you were taught to attend church because you'll go to hell if you don't. Or maybe you were taught to give 10% of your income because you'll go to hell if you don't. Uh, maybe you were told to read your Bible every day to make God happy with you. Or maybe you were told to pray every day to make God happy with you. And, and those things are good things and those things are great things. But salvation, forgiveness of sins, doesn't come from doing things externally. 
It doesn't happen by changing our behavior. Paul wrote that he was the best at being good. And he said, it's worthless. He said there was nobody like him living in the day that was as good as he was. Look at verses four through six. He described himself as having, he had every reason for confidence that he was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee like no other Pharisee. Paul said that there was nobody more passionate about obeying the Old Testament law than he was. And now he says it's all garbage. It was all worthless. It was all meaningless and pointless because he had surrendered his life to Jesus, that he was made righteous by what Jesus did for him. See, when it comes to being born again, when it comes to being made new, it is by faith alone in Jesus. If it's Jesus and anything else, you've got the wrong doctrine. You don't understand what grace is. See, it's not Jesus and church attendance. It's not Jesus and tithing. It's not Jesus and reading your Bible. It's not Jesus and praying. It's not Jesus and life group. It's not Jesus and serving. Jesus alone, by faith and trusting in Jesus alone, he is the only way to heaven. And that's what Paul was trying to explain to the Philippians. He says, guys, look, I know what they're teaching you and it's false doctrine. It's not true. That's why Paul sounds so angry in this passage of scripture. I mean, he calls them dogs. <laughs> like these dogs. You usually don't call somebody a dog unless you're willing to go toe to toe, you know, in a fight with them. And good thing he was in Roman garb because they could protect him from that. But he, he, he called them out and he called them dogs because they were actually preventing people from experiencing a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Can you imagine their evangelism strategy? They knock on the door of somebody and they, sh they, they tell you about Jesus and tell you about forgiveness of sins and you surrender your, your life to Jesus and then they hand you a knife and say, get her done. You know, they were preventing people from experiencing grace. And I think sometimes we do that as a church, not, not Calvary, but maybe you've been a part of a church where you weren't allowed to dress a certain way or look a certain way. You had to act a certain way in order to fit in and belong. Country clubs, preventing people from experiencing grace because we want to correct external behavior. No, thank you. And I'm so glad that I'm a part of Calvary that values life change, that values the gospel, that values transparent living and authenticity. After Paul lists all of his accomplishments that amounted to nothing but garbage, he says in verse eight, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite knowledge or infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. If, you are, if you're able to, I want you to circle a couple words in that passage. I want you to circle every time knowing or no shows up, and I want you to circle gain. Paul gained Christ. Don't let that slip over your head. He said, I gained Christ. The reason why Paul considered all the good stuff garbage is because he'd already received the infinite prize of Christ and growing in a relationship with God through Jesus. Now, when I gave my life to Jesus in 1991, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I gained Christ. Uh, when, when Paul met uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus and later when he surrendered his life to him, Paul gained Christ. When you gain Christ, you don't lose Christ. 
Hey, he doesn't slip away from you. All of a sudden, you're born again. The Holy Spirit is living inside you. That's called assurance of salvation. Paul had gained Christ. Let me ask you a question. When did you gain Christ? When did you gain Christ? If you could think of that time that you gained Christ, maybe you, you know the date exactly. Would you just write it out in the margins there? When did you gain Christ? Maybe you were a child and you gained Jesus. Maybe you walked an aisle in a church service and you surrendered your life to Jesus and you gained Christ. Maybe you were watching a televangelist on TV and you gained Christ. Maybe you were at a conference or convention. Maybe you were at an evangelistic event and you raised your hand and you gained Christ. Maybe you were sitting in a worship service last weekend and you gained Christ. I want you to think about that question that I'm asking you for just a minute because it's one of the most important questions that you'll answer. When did you gain Christ? Paul said nothing else matters. All of his success, all the wonderful things that he had done before in life, it didn't matter. And I want you to know, nothing else matters if you can't answer the question to the affirmative, I gained Christ in this date. I gained Christ on this time, or I, I have gained Christ. You might not remember the month or the day, but you know that you gained Christ. And if you would answer that question by saying, you know what, I have not yet gained Christ, but I want to. I have good news for you. Our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the service. They would love to help you gain Christ. All you have to do is walk down at the close of the service after the last song and say, hey, I'm ready to gain Christ. I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ and receive forgiveness for my sins and be born again and changed. Then you're going to begin to experience the same sentiment that Paul references here when he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. When Paul used that word know and knowing, um, Paul was using a word in the original language that could be used to describe the intimate relationship between a husband and wife. He was using this word of knowing Christ, which is really interesting because Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and then Jesus wasn't with him any longer in the, in the present, like eyeball to eyeball, physically there. And yet Paul said he was continuing to know Christ. Paul said in the present tense, he knew Jesus. When he was in that prison cell, when he was talking to the Roman guards, he was also talking to Jesus. Jesus was his friend in the present. He was his savior in the present. He was his helper in the present. He was his strength in the present. He was his guide in the present. Paul didn't allow that incredible born again experience that he had on the road to Damascus. He didn't allow that to be the end of his knowing Christ. But rather, he said, I want to know Christ more. I want to gain Christ more. I want to grow in my relationship with him more. And when it comes to knowing Jesus, we need to remember that knowing is growing. Knowing is growing. When you exchanged vows with your spouse and you became husband and wife, that was just the beginning of getting to know one another, right? If you would have asked me 22 years ago when Christy and I exchanged vows, do you know her? I would have said, yes, I know my wife. I would go back in time and say, no, you do not know your wife. And I think most of us would say something like that. That was the moment that I gained a spouse. That was the moment when you exchanged vows that you gained a spouse. But did you really, really know your spouse? 
Raise your hand if you would do me a favor. If you thought you knew your spouse when you were getting married, you thought you knew your spouse well when you were getting married, raise your hand if you were wrong. You did not know your spouse that well. Can you imagine if that day that I said yes 22 years ago, if I made that commitment and then I stopped trying to grow in my relationship with her, right? Can you imagine if I stopped talking to her? Like that was the last time I talked to her. To have and to hold for sickness and health till death to us part, I do. Okay, got that done. Punched that ticket, got married. If that had been the last time that I had spoken to my wife or the last time that I prayed for her or the last time that I encouraged her or the last time that I listened to her or the last time that I took her advice, our marriage would be on terrible footing right now if we were still married. And if we were still married, I'd probably be crying somewhere in some little closet of a room. The commitment that you made to Jesus when you surrendered your life to him, it's a lifelong commitment that requires you to grow in your relationship with him. See, it's not just about getting that salvation card, ticket to heaven punched. Now it's about growing in your relationship with him because the commitment that you made to follow Jesus yesterday is not enough to follow Jesus today. We must continue to grow, to learn, to trust, and to follow Jesus. And that's why I'm so excited about the, the grow class that we're going to begin to offer as a church. Uh, we're offering, we know, we recognize that, hey, we had intro and we've got serve and we got lead, but we were missing something. And one of the things that we were missing was a class that helps people grow in their relationship with Jesus. We'll, we'll stand up here and tell you all day long, if you're looking to be spiritually fed every sermon, it's not going to happen. So we want to help you begin to feed yourself and grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That class is gonna be offered on August 22nd and we're gonna continue to offer it. So, it, so when you see it being offered, sign up for it and take it. It's going to be an amazing class as the Apostle Paul said, nothing else matters but knowing Christ. Growing, a knowing is growing. And then finally, as we continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus, God brings us to a point that we get actually comfortable with what Paul was talking about in this passage. Not circumcision. His pending death. He starts off that passage talking about his death. He said, hey, look, regardless of what happens, rejoice. No matter what happens to me, rejoice. And he wraps that passage up in the closing verses of verse 10 and 11, demonstrating that even if he died, he would live again. See, the reality is for you and I, if we're a follower of Jesus, we will die and rise. We will die and we will rise. Now, I'm uncomfortable talking about death. I don't like talking about death when I think about my wife, when I think about my children, when I think about myself, my family, my loved ones. And most of us are a little bit uncomfortable with that whole idea of what if this happens? Am I ready or, or is my spouse ready or have I done everything that I can to help get them in a good trajectory and pointing them to Jesus? But I found that the more that I grow in knowing Jesus, the more that I grow in my relationship with God, the more comfortable I get in talking about death because I know that when I die, I will rise. I know that when I die, I will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. I know that when I die, I will be standing before God in heaven and worshiping him. And I don't know exactly what everything is going to be like in heaven. I don't have all the answers for that, but I have a confident hope. 
that my life doesn't end here on this earth. I have a confident hope that I will be with my Lord and my Savior forever, worshiping Him and glorifying Him. Paul held that hope. Paul said, look, even if I die, I'm going to attain the resurrection. And the Bible teaches us over and over again that followers of Jesus who have been forgiven for their sins will one day rise and live forever with God. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And I am so grateful that God is not a God who abandons us or forsakes us or neglects us, that he walks with us on this journey of life and then he brings us home with him. In heaven, there won't be any tears. There won't be any sorrow. There won't be any grief. There won't be any confusion. There won't be any sin. There won't be any brokenness. In heaven, there will not be a need for celebrate recovery. Right? In heaven, there's no hospitals. In heaven, there's no funeral homes. There's no more death, no more sorrow, no more weeping. All because Jesus was willing to pay the price on the cross for you and for me. He paid the price for our sins. So have you gained Christ? Have you trusted in Christ? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Then take heart because you're gonna rise again. You might not die the way that you want to, but you're gonna be blessed for all eternity. Let's pray together. Father, we wanna say thank you for your word and thank you for Paul's example. Thank you for the way that he uh, wrote passionately to these followers of Jesus and he called out the troublemakers. And thank you, Father, that we are not saved. We are, are not born again. We're not changed by anything other than the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins and by the faith that we have that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead and that one day he's going to return. Our faith is in you. And we know that there's nothing we can do. All these other things are good, but there's nothing that we can do to earn our ticket into heaven. Thank you for our love. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the kindness that you show to us. And thank you that it is your kindness that draws people to repentance. Lord, we continue to pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work and change people's lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.